so um, let me start out. So let me start out by allowing each of the panelists here to give a quick introduction to themselves. Please focus. Please wait for one to two minutes. Talk a little bit about yourself um, and the organization you're representing and what your role is in the organization. Hi, um, thanks everyone for coming. My name is Reed Galen, and uh, I am the chief strategist for the Serve America movement. We call it SAM, um, and we've known the United America guys for a uh, better part of, I don't know, a couple of years. Um, but we, uh, we started in the aftermath of the 2016 campaign, and uh, our founders said, you know, whether or not you voted for Hillary Clinton or you voted for Donald Trump, um, the, the path that got us to a place where the two nom major party nominees had an aggregate negative rating of like 119%. Uh, was something that sort of showed a fundamental flaw in how we were uh, conducting our politics, choosing our candidates, electing our candidates, and all that. And so I came on board about a year ago, and really it was a, a process of figuring out, okay, we called ourselves the Serve America Movement. What does that mean? What does it, what does it mean to build a movement? And, and we, we spent a lot of time in conference rooms arguing with people and, and spent you know, a fair amount of time with whiteboards and very high-minded ideals, and people are going to love this stuff. Uh, and then we decided to start actually doing some field testing. We went to Kansas the first quarter of this year, and um, we did, for lack of a better way to put it, a, 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 a political science experiment for 90 days involving 1,000 registered voters in Kansas, and uh, had a bunch of assumptions and found out every single one of them was wrong. So um, while that was uh, a good lesson to learn, it also very much helped our uh, d direction and after about you know six, seven more months of soul searching, we decided that from our perspective anyway, we were going to approach uh, you know reform as a as a party building exercise, and obviously uh, part and parcel of that is an electoral reform exercise. So um, be happy to talk more about that. Thanks. Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Rex. Um, I'm sort of a late arrival to the uh, political scene. Um, I've been an educator all my life. Uh, started out as a high school English teacher, football coach, eventually ended up as a college president in South Carolina. And um, a good friend of mine, a former governor named Dick Riley, talked me into running for office for the very first time when I was 65 years old. I uh, toyed with the idea of writing a book, careful if you run for office you might win, because I did. And I ran as a Democrat in South Carolina, which is about like running as a third party candidate. And uh, won by 455 votes out of 1.1 million, the closest uh, margin in the history of our state for a statewide office. I ran for Secretary of Education. Um, so that was my introduction to politics. Um, in that year, which was 2006, a gentleman I did not know, Oscar Lovelace, uh, decided to run for the first time also. And he ran for governor. He's a family practitioner. He's in the back of the room. Ultimately, ended up being the co founder of a new political party with me. Oscar ran uh, as a Republican, as I said, against a, um, a soon-to-be infamous governor, an uh, incumbent named Mark Sanford, who was on the Appalachian Trail by way of Argentina. Uh, Oscar, uh, of course, didn't win because the Republican Party embraced their incumbent. And, but over that four-month period, he, he gave one hell of a try. Um, I've already told you I did win, so what he experienced for four months, I experienced for four years. Um, and so that uh, the Democratic Party, like the Republican Party, was really not interested in, in, in representing voters or in solving problems or really even following through on, on the rhetoric that they, that they espouse. So um, after I got out of office, Oscar and I, who became friends, decided there had to be a better way. We started talking to people in our state, and uh, out of that came uh, the American Party. The party was certified in 2014 in South Carolina, so we've been at this now with our sleeves rolled up and sweat on our brows for four years. We'll talk about that later, I guess. Um, but we decided early on that we wanted a platform for independent candidates. And uh, we wanted to provide an option for independent voters, and that the, the parties could not and would not self-correct. It had to be done from outside, it had to be done on the ballot. And that's why we're uh, firm believers in the party option. And uh, I'll share that bias with you right up, right up front, because I know that's a big part of our discussion here over the next day and a half. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Niels Ferguson. I come from 
great to see next door of Utah. Um, I'm representing a new party called the United Utah Party. We uh, were formed last year um, when a group of, of um, sort of political uh, people who've been involved in the state with both Republican and Democratic parties um, similarly felt that things weren't going so well. For those who have followed Utah at all, you know we're a very clearly one, one party dominant state. Um, so we like to say United Utah Party is not trying to be a third party, we're trying to be the second party in our state. Um, and it may not take much to get there, but um, a, 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 an opportunity sprung up last year when our uh, Congressman Jason Chaffetz resigned um, and these people who've been talking about the possibility of, of forming a, a party decided to, to expedite those plans and, and get someone on the ballot for that race. Um, long story short, they applied, they got more than enough signatures in a very short period of time, and uh, the state um, lieutenant governor's office who oversees elections determined that oh, we, it needed 30 days to process our application, and the, the window for applying for that um, office was less than 30 days, and so um, we thought this was unfair, took it to court. Um, the state fought back and got us a lot of great press. We won the, we won the lawsuit and were able to get on the ballot. So we had a, our first candidate ran in 2017 um, and uh, hit a lot of milestones. We, he only was campaigning for a couple of months by the time all the lawsuit played out, uh, but uh, was able to qualify for um, meeting the thresholds by the Utah Debate Commission to appear in the debate, the first time a third party candidate has ever done that, and got a higher vote percentage um, despite running against a moderate Republican who ended up coming out of the, the Republican primary process for them. So we, you know, we, we, we ended up not winning, but with a very short period of time feeling like we made great strides forward and um, were able to catch attention of a lot of people in the state. We um, uh, recruited for this, this cycle. We have 18 candidates running across the state, two at the congressional level. Um, two at county levels, which are partisan in our state, though we'd like to change that, and then uh, four uh, 14 candidates running for various state legislature positions. Um, one of the things that we've looked at in the state of Utah, it being you know, a, a unique state, we're the youngest state on average of any state in the country. Um, we used to be, years ago, the, the most um, actively participating in elections and other civic engagement. We're now in the low 40s or in the low 30s or high, or high 40s, so we've, we've scaled back. A lot of people feel dissatisfied. Um, you know, a lot of you followed the, the 2016 campaign with Evan McMullen and how they, they focused heavily on Utah. You know, a lot of great stuff came out of that, but for us, one of, the, one of the great things is a wealth of information of where a lot of these dissatisfied voters really are, and it's allowed us to target. Um, and, and so we're, we're pushing forward this year. We have goal we have uh, of our 18 races that we're running seven of them are without a democrat in the race so we're running head to head against the republican in a lot of these races alex who's sitting here in the front is, is one of those even though the democratic democrats have recently tried to uh squeeze someone in but he fought back and and is doing a great job at that um and you know we we have a goal to to win some races this year and to continue to build um Again, it's, a, it's an experiment, it's new, uh, but there's a lot of great, great momentum that in a very short time I think we've been able to build up, and so we're excited to be part of this greater national movement and, and working in this area. My name is Phil Fuhrer, I'm state chair of the Independence Party of Minnesota. I'd like to say that we're the most successful third party in the country. We shocked the world uh, in 98 with the election of Governor Jesse Ventura. Uh, our roots go back to the uh, Ross Perot movement, and the genesis is in 1992, uh, the fall of 92, and, and Perot's uh, presidential run. Uh, we achieved major party status in Minnesota. To do that, uh, the easiest way to do that is to get 5% of the vote in a statewide election. Uh, we did that in 94. We were a major party for 20 years, from uh, January 1st, 95, through uh, December 31st, 2014. Uh, when we lost major party status, we did or have dipped back down to uh, minor party status, was, which does require us the uh, the hardest or the, the most difficult pill to swallow on that is to have to petition uh, to get back onto the ballot. 
we have elected, in addition to Governor Ventura, uh, a state senator uh, in 2000, and a handful of mayors, city council members, uh, county commissioners. Those are, uh, as in most states, uh, nonpartisan offices, so they're not actually on the ballot uh, as uh, IP members, but they are uh, IP supporters. We have suffered some attrition. Um, and it, it, that led us to the 2014 reduction of minor party status. Starting in about 2011, um, we began to, uh, to suffer a bit of attrition. Uh, that led us to uh, the, our 2014, where our best candidate for statewide office got 4.91%. Uh, that's not five, 1,800 votes short, and uh, brought us down to, to minor party status. That has led me to firmly believe that ballot access is one of the most critical pieces of the independent movement of third party movements. Uh, it hurts recruitment, uh, candidates, and then we've got it fairly easy in Minnesota, for, you know, all things considered, uh, to get on the ballot. But candidates are reticent to run if they've got a petition to get on the ballot. Now, part of that starts to come in the, the infrastructure that's behind uh, the party, uh, and that's part of the problem, the problem that we had, uh, is, is uh, the winning of Governor Ventura in 98 as a, a five-year-old party, six-year-old party was probably the worst thing that happened to us, or one of the worst things that happened to us. Too much growth, too quickly, uh, and, and, uh, and unfortunately, a, a uh, office holder that didn't work to grow the party. He did some things, so I won't take away from Governor Ventura there. I, I'm not one that says that he did do nothing. He did do some things, but he didn't grow the party. And I think the uh, uh, leadership at the time, uh, and subsequently over the, the decade of the 2000s, really didn't put a lot of that infrastructure in place, putting in local leaders, putting in uh, county units or legislative district units, um, making sure that uh, we were still resonating with people and, and bringing new people in, um, which led us to, the, 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 to 2014. Uh, we've tried, to, I took over the chairmanship in October 2015. I have tried to begin to resurrect uh, the party, bring us back up, bring us back into major party status. We joined forces with Evan, Evan McMullen's campaign in 2016 in August, uh, and uh, in eight and a half days, uh, petitioned, uh, got 2,500 signatures um, with an all-volunteer effort. Uh, do credit the McMullen campaign. Uh, we were coming up a uh, smidge short. Uh, I think we ended up getting about 1,800 or 1,825 or 1,775 signatures. They put us over the top of some of their folks, brought a couple of folks in to help us out. I think they uh, may have paid a, a, a signer or two uh, to get us 2,500 signatures. Uh, for us, in eight and a half days, that was a, a great accomplishment. Uh, for 20 years, we never had a petition, so we were and still are very proud of that. Uh, that was the beginning of, of getting us back. We now take us to 2018. We are running a single statewide candidate, a Secretary of State candidate, uh, who's one of, one of whose mantra, William Dennis is his name, one of his mantras is that uh, the Secretary, Secretary of State office, if anybody should be neutral, it should be the chief election official. And while you can say that, well, Phil, the Independence Party is, is a, it's a party. Yes, my definition, third parties are independents. Uh, independents can become part of the third party. If you're outside of the duopoly, you're an independent. Um, the reason we're running a single candidate is you, we've got to start thinking outside the box. And we've heard that here today, I think, of latching our ships together uh, in, in the opening panel uh, upstairs. Of, we're all in different groups and working together to make things happen. So in Minnesota, what I did in uh, starting in 2017 is I reached out to the Green Party, reached out to the Libertarian Party. We have a legal marijuana party in Minnesota uh, and began to open up conversations of saying, look, let's look at the math. The math is clear. Going back to 2006 and working our way forward, depending on the election, six to eight and a half or nine percent, protest vote, independent vote, third party vote, whatever language you want to use, there's a base of folks out there that will not support the duopoly. All we're doing is cannibalizing each other when we all run for these offices. Got the Greens and the Libertarians to agree, legal marijuana does their own thing. 
uh, I didn't agree, um, but we were able to, to stand down races in our Secretary of State race. It is a three-way race, and I have full confidence that we're going to get major party status back here in 2018, which I'm hoping to slingshot uh, that uh, positive press. The candidates that I think will come back again now that we will be a major party status, which also comes, we have partial public financing in Minnesota, so some money will come with that, and we can move forward in 2020. And in fact, I'm hoping to talk to some of my colleagues here and continue some conversations we've started of seeing if we can't form a, uh, some sort of 2020 presidential coalition. Um, but those are, are nascent conversations. Thanks. Um, let me just, uh, uh, Brian, let me just, uh, you know, as part of your introduction, just move in first thing. So Brian, you're a candidate for Oregon House, is that correct? Correct. Uh, so if you could just give a little bit of an introduction on the Independent Party of Oregon, um, as well as uh, talk about what you're looking for when aligning with the party and what support you're looking for as a candidate. Sure, uh, it's a great question. Again, my name is Brian Gerson, representing the Independent Party of Oregon, uh, and I have been in politics all of six months. I was a <laughs> Fortune 500 executive, running businesses, army officer, done just about everything in politics other than I voted. And got to that point of saying, I'm frustrated, like the rest of us, and said, okay, I want to try to make a difference. Well, I should get into politics. Well, I was a lifelong Republican. And then I said, okay, I want to run for office. And went to the Republican Party, and they said, you believe in this, this, and this. Sign here. And I said, no. And then I went to the Democratic Party. Same thing. Do you support this, this, and this? I said, well, not really. So I then approached the Independent Party because I want to be able to use the same principles I applied in business, but we made the best decision. Sometimes it wasn't left, and sometimes it wasn't right, but it was what the right thing was for the people, the company, whoever you're supporting. And so that's how I became associated about seven or eight months ago with the Independent Party. Uh, made the you know the official uh, party switch, and then realized even though in Oregon the independent party has full um, major party status. So that part was easy. But as far as infrastructure, support, what to do, who to talk to, even how to go about a campaign, not so much. And so as a candidate, what we're seeing is as, you know, that's why I was excited to uh, be, you know, contacted and, you know, participate with the Unite Movement to be able to talk to like-minded people and get some best known practices. Because that's some of the challenges in, the different, in our different parties that we've seen as a candidate. We just don't have the infrastructure. And as I started to learn the system, and you know, I, in Oregon I learned this thing called a blended nomination. Because in my district, there was no Republican running. So I said, hmm, okay. Well, can I win the write-in vote? And then maybe carry that? Well, sure enough, I ended up winning the Republican write in. So I ended up cross nominated. When I, I'm sharing that, I then got to see the infrastructure of the Republican Party. And I have on my phone phone lists and walking diagrams and can go to the computer, oh, I want to see 10 homes today, and it prints out for me. Or I, this is a disaffected voter, they generally vote this way. And unfortunately, none of that was available to me as an independent. It was Great, glad you're running. There's your district. Have at it. So I think one of the challenges that I think we need to address is the infrastructure to be successful. And to be able to have some form of maybe training and recruiting mechanism from the different states. You know, because uh, you know, not to sound arrogant, but I fell into the into the independent party. I think we have an opportunity to target other people that are disaffected. They want to make a difference in the country, but provide them some form of infrastructure to both recruit them and then once you're there, okay, here's kind of a, at least the basics of a playlist of what you could do or playbook to be able to be successful as you, as you start the journey. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm just going to ask one question, then I'm going to turn it over to the audience. Uh, I'd actually like to focus this question on Reed and uh, Neil, since you're the newer parties. Um, what what does it take to actually start a party? What does that involve? What are the steps involved? And what are some of the big discussions? Like, Reed, you talked about big discussions. Um, 
uh, that are involved. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about that region. Um, yeah, sure. So um, we are uh, we are starting a party, but we have no party anywhere yet. So um, so we are working on that. Our our first uh, our first candidate is running for governor of New York, uh, admittedly against. Uh, Governor Cuomo, and uh, if he keeps hating America, then our chances are going to go up. Um, but she's a, a woman named Stephanie Miner. She is the former mayor of Syracuse. Uh, she is a Democrat. Um, she and Governor Cuomo got into it very publicly about three, four years ago about public pensions, um, and she was roundly uh, turned out of the party, and uh, and really saw the ugliness um, that that occurred after that, where her state, her city. Uh, suffered in the legislature because uh, Cuomo was uh, just going after her on a daily basis and anything that could possibly help Syracuse was not going to get done. And so uh, we met, uh, it was a very quick engagement. We met in May. She was carrying our banner by June and uh, she will qualify for the November ballot next uh, week. It, uh, listen, I mean it's Cuomo, Cynthia Nixon, Stephanie, um, the Republican guy whose name I can't recall. Um, so um, it's well, probably nobody else in New York can either, so it doesn't matter. Uh, the point is, is that you know, look, it's, it, if it if it, remain, if it becomes a four-way race, a true four-way race, it is nothing but an uphill climb for Stephanie. That is for sure. Um, but that being said, you know, if she gets fifty thousand votes on election day, Sam will have ballot access in New York for the next four years, and so we will be from mayor of New York to you know Buffalo City Council, whatever it is, we will be able to do that. So that'll be our first state. Um, but as you all know, um, and if you're not, I'm happy to give you the tutorial on looking at the Secretary of State website in 50 different states. Literally every state has its thing. Uh, so like New York, there are 11 states in this country where only a candidate uh, can help create a party. They have to carry the banner. And while we are supporting Stephanie, Sam is technically an external entity, so we can't even directly help her. We, can't, we have to stay on the outside. We can generally say Sam is good in New York, but we can't coordinate with her campaign. On November 8th, you know, and, and she runs out again, we can coordinate to the nth degree, give her all the money we want, but we have, we're sort of bound by this, you know, these arcane rules. In a state like Florida, where I know we have some folks from Florida, uh, you know, the ballot access process is really a paperwork thing. You, you write your bylaws, you identify your, your officers, uh, they register to vote with your party, you turn it in, and hopefully six months later, some white smoke comes out of the chimney in Tallahassee, and they say, congratulations, you have been bestowed a party in the state of Florida. Um, and then in many states, like, you know, in Colorado here, you know, it's a two-step process. You can either get your 10,000 signatures, file as a qualified political organization, and get 1,000 people to register. So these are the things I spend my day doing. It's either studying how to become a party in these 50 states, writing bylaws, trying to find leadership, uh, and so the thing that I have found, and I'm sure everyone up here uh, who is already doing this, is that every success only begets a heck of a lot more work and makes it a lot harder. And so I, I'm so happy that like Jim and others are ha have candidates. Like I am like six steps away from even thinking about who my first candidate is going to be. And I know that November 20, I'm going to have them in a whole bunch of different states. And so we are um, we are very ambitious. I'll be, I'll be very clear about that. We are hoping to have access in five states by the end of this year uh, and have a plan to get, you know, hopefully 20 or 30 more done next year. And we'll need a lot of help from the folks in this room, even if you're not party people. Uh, we're going to help provide a line for folks and, you know, probably help avoid the, the petition stuff and that and help get people on the ballot. So, and I'll turn it over to you. Well, you know, a lot of that, that initial petitioning and getting in, in Utah was that was kind of the easy part for us there was demand there we were able to get signatures and very quickly lawsuits notwithstanding and everything um, become a qualified political party in the state um, sort of the next steps though and, and, and what um, Reese just talking about it gets it's more difficult um, and some of these you know fundamental rungs of the ladder of, of building a party um, and I think a lot of them are applicable for, for independent candidates or independent movements as, as well. Um, I've kind of identified four different areas, one being a, a plan for sustainability, um, one being the infrastructure, we've talked a lot about that here, and another one I, I call identity, um, and I'll talk about that, and then maybe mandate or uh, credibility. Um, that a lot, those last two are very sort of that psychological side of things that Nick was talking about this morning. 
Um, infrastructure, you know, well, we, we chose to, to build, luckily we had a lot of people early on in the party who had been involved in party structures and, and had experience with that. So um, we set up committees, um, we've broken into volunteers, events, um, media and outreach, um, uh, fu fundraising and you know, like, you know, research. Um, got committees, chairs, volunteers who, who went in there. We started early on as we were petitioning for the party, encouraging volunteers to sign up. Um, and this year our project is largely in addition to running our campaigns has been setting up um, county level uh, party infrastructure. Um, we have 29 counties in Utah, but we have party infrastructure now in seven of those that complement that together is about 85% of our voting population. So we have a lot of rural areas that we haven't quite reached, but the vast majority of our of our people have a, a county level organization. Um, and we've been digging down even further, putting chairs in place to cover legislative districts, state legislative districts, um, and now we're trying to dig down to the precinct level. Um, we've we've been very strategic about this. We know we can't get all of them. There's 4,000 precincts in our state, but uh, identifying, you know, here are the top 300 where we have the best chance of, of sort of a natural base of votes. So that's been sort of the infrastructure side, and that's why they brought me on board, is to sort of oversee that, that initial infrastructure development. Um, and that's, you know, a lot of work takes a lot of time, but that's also a little bit more straightforward. These other things, um, you know, they all play into the sustainability thing, but the identity and the legitimacy are a little bit more difficult. Um, we've done substantial polling to see w when we were deciding whether or not to, to actually go a party route, to try to go independent route, and some of this in the first place. Uh, we found that there is a you know a, a human nature that that has a quick identification with the idea of a party. So rather than reinventing the wheel over and over again, we found that 60 to 70 percent of people in the state of Utah um, felt that both the Republicans and the Democrats were not moderate enough for them. They wanted something in the middle, and there was a demand for that. Um, we found recently that of those who are aware of our party, that 70 or more percent say they're more likely to vote for our candidates, knowing nothing else about our candidates, say they um, support you know what we're doing. But those are people who can identify who we are and identify some distinguishing factors about who we are as a party. Uh, the, the tough part is, is that the vast majority of the state still hasn't heard of us, or they've heard of us and don't know who we are. So that's been our other big challenge. Um, so we've, we've had to really push a fundraising for the sake of identity and brand building effort. And so over the next few weeks, this is what we've been doing. We're, putting, we're bringing out commercial, several other shorts, um, strategically advertising that. And so having a plan for how you're going to market yourself as a party, we see as sort of crucial, and, and, and in some of our races, we've got a couple of our candidates here hoping that that gets them a few extra percentage. They'll, they'll be campaigning on their name in their districts, but they can't reach everyone. So are some of those people coming in and saying, yes, I know what United Utah is, and while I didn't get a chance to learn about this candidate, I'm still not satisfied with the two-party system, and I'm, and I'm willing to, to move there. Um, and all of that then plays into um, the legitimacy factor. Um, fundraising has been uh, probably our biggest challenge. We found great moral support, um, but not always in the form of coming out of someone's pockets. And so um, a lot of people, they, they, want to, they want to see that horse win a race before they start betting on it in the future. So we run into this again and again where they say, keep going, we love what you're doing, we really hope you win, and we'd love to fund you next year if, if you do. Um, so we had to strategize how we, how, how we move away from some of that traditional political donorship, which I personally think isn't such a bad thing. It gives us a chance to be more organic, to go to small donors, to get more of a grassroots development, but that obviously takes a certain level of work and infrastructure that's needed. And so those are sort of the, the steps that we've been taking um, and continue to be part of our growing process. Great. Uh, I want to turn it over to questions uh, in the audience. Sure. I, I think uh, as a nothing but a political spectator, almost a citizen here, interested. Um, I, what runs through all this for me, the, the elephant in the room to me, it seems like is where are you going to get the money? I mean, you've got these huge machines, multi-million dollar machines in the two-party system. 
you know, one of the big criticisms is they're all taking money from special interests, they're beholden to special interests. How can you compete without that kind of money? And if you have that kind of money, aren't you also going to become beholden no matter how well you want to be? What's the I guess you didn't know that there's going to be something passed around the room. <laughs> 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 they, they, they didn't tell you that. Um, you know, that, that is one of the reasons I said earlier that we have this bias toward parties because, um, you know, our country, for better or worse, has been immersed in parties. You, those statistics this morning, I think it was 52% of, of Democrats, 48% of um, Republicans said they thought there should be a third party. Not that there should be independence, but they're a third party. Marshall McLuhan, a writer who only the older people probably remember, once said, um, I don't know who discovered water, but I'm damn sure it was not a fish. Mo most of us have spent our lives, and the people we know have spent their lives, thinking about politics in America as being a party process. And I think it's not only important in terms of dealing with votes, it's important in terms of dealing with money. And so you can have lots of people out there asking for money to reform the system. We're all, we're all for that, all of us in this room. But I think you're going to have to have, at some point, a viable alternative, which most Americans will identify as a political party. It can be a different kind of political party. It can function differently. But, I, you know, the Tea Party, that was talked about this morning. There are a lot of Americans who think that's a political party because it has the word party in it. And so... Um, I think the money's there, and you're right, some of those will be special interests. Maybe a new definition of a party can be to say no to certain types of special interests, or at least to qualify what the money means in terms of their obligation for uh, receiving it. But um, I, I think the money's there. I think the discontent is growing, and it's growing among some wealthy people. Sam, for example, as far as I know, has gotten a lot of money from Morgan Stanley and, and other people. Well, a lot by my side. They want to give us more, we'll take it. Yeah. So there are people because, with... Because, but let me just say, yeah. because look, you know, I'd love to take $27 at a time from 10 million people. That's unlikely to happen right now. And so the question is, do it or not do it? You know, understand that there's money available. Are you going to take it to do the things you need to do? Or are you going to say, I can't do this, and I'm not going to do this, so therefore I'm just going to sit here and say, I wish I had done that. The money's there, and I think there's some equalizers, certainly the social network and other things that can, that can make a difference. You don't have to raise dollar for dollar to compete. Let, let me piggyback on the dollar for dollar because I think that's an important aspect. You don't have to have or spend the most money. You have to have enough money to get your message out. Now, you can say, well, Phil, you, you've done that. You've had candidates, uh, other folks have had candidates. The other structural barriers are still in place that we also need to overcome. The waste boat syndrome is very powerful. Tribalism, very powerful. Uh, I've taken in the last couple of years to tell folks that we're, we're finally in the Independence Party of Minnesota, maybe have, are starting to get some what I call legacy voters. They're the children of folks that have been in the Independence Party since the mid-90s. The Democrats, Republicans, they're all full of legacy voters. My daddy was a, was a Democrat, my granddaddy was a Democrat, and his granddaddy was a Democrat, I'm a, I'm a Democrat. Those are tough forces to overcome. You don't need to have the most money though, just enough. Uh, another structural barrier to put on your list if you're looking at, at reforms, I, and what I think right now is a positive for taking a party route is public campaign finance. We've got a partial public campaign, campaign finance system in Minnesota. Maine's got a system, I'm not sure how open that is, uh, but it may, may be uh, limited to, to partisans or parties, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, et cetera. There's money there, at least in Minnesota, for example, uh, as a major party, and it's enough to get message out, but there are some other structural reforms that we have to do. There's one, one follow-up, if I may. From an Oregon perspective, go small and win big, because we need to win. And small campaigns, small elections, house seats, etc. You can generally figure out enough funding that you can not be quite on par with the major parties, but you, for what you need to do to play and win, that's the strategy for us. We're looking and going. Okay, if we can get two, three people into that into the house, all of a sudden, that becomes real. And as Americans, we tend to 
luck for winners is what's being said. That's where mo money follows the money. So then it's that challenge of maintaining that we don't lose our identity, which was we self-funded, we maintain small, and scale I think will be the challenge for all of us. Is any time we try to scale a race, if you look at a congressional race, now you're in the millions of dollars. And we just, that part, initially I think we're gonna, we need to find some places we can play and win, target some, you know, where we have an unopposed candidate. That's what I chose to do. There was no Republican running there. And so it was a little bit easier to get that toehold in. So I think if we take a, take a look at finding those places where there may be an incumbent that's unopposed, putting up the independent candidate, and then spending reasonably to play and win gives us that chance. One last question. In the corner here. Um, it seems to me that uh, one of America's greatest strengths is our diversity. And I come to a summit like this, and I don't see it. I want to know how the parties um, are trying to, the parties that are represented here are trying to address America's greatest strength in the world. Yeah, I have. Uh, how are we addressing diversity? Well, let me start. Uh, we've got a, we have a great candidate. Is this a table of five white guys? Or what's yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. I can't even count. It's a challenge in one of the early panels, you know, the Perot movement was a party of angry white men. And, and in a lot of ways, even in our party, it hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, but we're working at reaching out, actively trying to reach out to some folks now. Now, part of, part of our issue, I think, is that, A, we don't want tokenism, and we don't want, uh, you know, that the, the, the idea that we're, we're just bringing you in to, to just, just to bring you in and, and increase our, our ballot effectiveness. We want folks to come in that are moderate centrists, fiscally responsible, socially inclusive. Uh, but we realize that we've got to go out and, and talk to folks. We recruited uh, or had a candidate come in in our Minnesota 8th Congressional District. That's in the Arrowhead region of Minnesota, the Duluth area, uh, and, uh, and Ojibwe Anishinaabe uh, tribal elder. He was a Green Party candidate in 2014. He's decided to come over to the Independence Party. We welcomed him with full arms. And we've got some, some structural problems in the 8th Congressional District. And I'm entirely open and I'm offered to open up the doors and let his folks come in and be our, our, our party in the 8th Congressional District. Um, so it's those kinds of things. It's reaching out to the African American community in Minneapolis in particular um, and, and sort of asking, and somebody mentioned this earlier, about rural voters, you know, in rural, rural America, you might say, what has the Republican Party really done for you? In Minneapolis, we're sit, trying to sit down with some African American leaders that, that have exhibited some, some maverickness, some independence, and saying, what is the DFL really, uh, Democratic Party and Labor Party in Minnesota is the Democratic Party, what has the DFL really done for you? Um, and, and actively trying to bring people in. So you've got to reach out to folks actively. Very quickly, uh, the American Party in South Carolina has eight candidates on the ballot this year. Um, two are women. We have an Indian immigrant. We have an African American. We have a 24-year-old. We have a Vietnam veteran. So we're we're working at it, and uh, you know, part of that is through uh, being, you know, doing this for four years in the state. It's through getting past candidates to talk about the positive aspects of running for office, even if you don't win. Someone earlier in this room was talking about you can win lots of ways other than just winning the election itself. And so making it easier for normal, common people to envision themselves running for office is part of it. And we use a convention process, not a primary process in our case, which makes it less expensive, less arduous, less personal, less nasty, and more realistic and viable for people who want to run for public office. I think that's part of the answer to get the kind of diversity and I think everybody here knows is lacking thus far in our quote-unquote movement. Great. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh